honestly, it's every day. Every day you come home and you just see his tag wa- or his, <laughs> his tail wagging. I think I think that's the biggest thing. You know, no matter if it's a good day or a bad day or a good game or a bad game, you know, you come home and he's wagging his tail and he's he's happy to see you. And I think that that always puts a smile on my face. <laughs>
is a cough Mm -hmm. and I can talk for like two or three sentences and then it's like, I have no air left and I've got a cough. So, um, battled through that. That was kind of most of the California trip that we just went on. What a terrible time to have it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Like I get, I could get the vitamin D if you will. Plenty. But it just seemed that I would be feeling pretty good. Most of the day we'd get into the cold rink and start coughing immediately. So, um, a long time ago when I first got in the business, I went to the gray cup in Vancouver. I was working for city TV or sorry, a channel. And I got to the gray cup and the first night we were there, I lost my voice. So automatically everybody that's thinks you were partying. That's the best. Yeah. That's, and you know, I'm not going to lie. I was a partier in those days, but I, I literally legitimately, they had to go live the next day. And I was like, <sighs> like, were you partying last night? No, I wasn't. Nobody believed me, but I got my voice for Grey Cup Sunday, but the whole week was a, was a, it was a gamble. So I told you, and that was in November. Well, and if anybody wants to dig it up, you can go back in the old archives on winnipegjets.com, find the Patrick line, a five goal game in St. Louis. Guess who was battling pneumonia? That stand-up was a grind. <laughs> Before we move on to the Jets themselves, like the, one of the most stressful part of our job, and I did it with, you know, sometimes you wouldn't go on the road, was that stand-up before, mm-hmm. after a game, and the bus is leaving. Like, I never understood yeah. urgency until you have to do a stand-up yeah. on your bench, on the team's bench, while everybody's packing up around you. Yeah, so, and, and more often than not, there's uh, usually someone that like works with the visiting team, yeah. kind of cleaning up the bench too. So yeah. you're just kind of like, I need like a minute and a half, and he's like, okay, and he just stands there, and, and you're like, yeah, and the okay, of, I guess I have to be perfect. It's amazing <laughs> how many people sit there and stare at you yeah. when you do something like that. Which you know we've done it so many times, but it still is nerve wracking when mm-hmm. you're standing there trying to nail exact details. And those people that are watching don't know if you're lying or not, if you made a mistake, right? But and you know, one of my favorite. Uh, memories this wasn't even necessarily with the team but uh, a stand-up that I did the, it was one of those times where the the Stanley Cup was coming in and around Winnipeg mm-hmm. uh, I think this is early 2011 or so um, and I went out there and there's a line of people to see the Stanley Cup but so like for the shot we need to have the Stanley Cup in the background so I'm doing this stand-up right next to a line of I want to say 45 50 people and I'm just like this is going to be one of those days, as, and it was <laughs> oh. seven, eight, nine oh. takes, and every, and it's like the first four or five, it was in the same spot every single time. So when I was doing my my sixth take, I guess, yeah, and I got past that point, you could see it in everybody's face. They're like, "Oh, he got past it," and then like I started laughing because everybody made the made a face, and oh, because you notice they like you notice when people are staring at you, especially in those oh, situations. Yeah. Something we have noticed, and. We're just coming to, we're taping this Tuesday morning. The Jets have fallen in overtime to the Montreal Canadiens 3-2. A game they trailed 2-0, fought back to tie it up at 2, uh, gave a power play game, goal in overtime, which brings us to the first topic or concern. And again, we're nitpicking here because the team is playing very well. Mm-hmm. They're only one point out of first place in the Central Division, a very competitive top three in the Central right now with Colorado and Dallas. Special teams. Yeah. We've talked incessantly about the five-on-five play for the Jets, which has been spectacular it really has but you know you did a little math in your head it's maybe four games where yeah. give or take where special teams has cost them two yeah. points or one point and the standard in the room would be even higher they'd probably argue there's a uh, even more games where they would find you know a situation where hey a kill here or a kill there mm-hmm. um and the challenges and i remember talking to dylan demello about the penalty kill we'll start there uh, in arizona uh and like it was the day before the Nito Niederreiter hat trick game, I believe. And he, he was just saying like the frustrating part with the penalty kill is like, it's not even like it's one thing, right? Like, or one specific thing that you can look at because he's like, it's not like we're getting seamed to death out no. there. Teams are having a tough time finding that seam. Um, but he goes, it's a bounce here. We'll, we'll kill off a minute 45 of it and it'll look great. And then for whatever reason, there'll be a bounce here, bang, back of the net or every little mistake is just finding its way in. It's not, it's not necessarily a goaltender's fault or anybody. It's just that's how it's been going for Winnipeg this year on the penalty kill. A little bit of personnel change, certainly, um, but I think they would have kind of ironed through some of that. I thought one of the best ways that, that I've ever heard it put, uh, Rick Bonus one day said, it's like we're overcooking the penalty kill a little bit because sometimes you'll get stuck out there and then – all these guys want to be the reason or want to make sure that the penalty kill works and they get a little bit out of unison. They over, they over stretch themselves. They overdo something. They get out of formation a little bit. There's your seam pass. And there it is in the back of the net. So it's just a little bit of details. The power plays like 
I find that the most confounding thing because I remember the first game of the season in Calgary and the Jets power play. I don't think they scored, but they looked tremendous. Mm -hmm. The amount of speed and motion and fluidity, they were all over the place. Like I think, I think Mark Scheifele was in the, the left dot, the slot, net front mm -hmm. slot. Like he, he was everywhere. Um, so I think, and then Gabriel Velarde gets hurt. You have to make adjustments and, and whatnot. And now Kyle, Connor, Kyle Connor's sure. out. So that's certainly a, a lethal part of your power play. So I think there's a little bit of some adjustment there going on. But I think ultimately it, with power play, it always comes down to execution and, and, and how quickly you're moving the puck. So I'm sure those things are being hammered in on the Winnipeg Jets during every single power play meeting, which I'm sure they have every single day. It's just – for whatever reason, not going with the regularity that you would expect with the skill out there. Um, we just talked about Gabe Velarde, and this is our, our, our last topic here. And um, listen, he missed a, lar a long, long. Mm -hmm. He was out a long time. Didn't now it does not look like he did. No. He claims that there's still some more, which is absolutely terrifying if you're another team. But let's speak to where Gabe Velarde is right now and what the Jets have in this 24 year old forward. Yeah. I love watching him play along the boards, honestly. That's, mm. and like, it's, yeah, he scored some, he's made some skilled plays in front of the net and you know, the deflection against Anaheim, the insurance marker against Colorado, he's made some, some really nice plays in and around the net, but it's his work along the walls. Like the, I believe it was Mark Shifley. He set up against Chicago, you know, on the, that was a power play rush where he just makes this, it looks like he's just going to go up that strong side wall and he just decides, Nope. Yeah. and cuts and, and makes a move, gets himself into space, and then the Jets are in a dangerous spot. So he's a big body, and I think now that he you know, had commented on the fact he's got to wear a brace the rest of the year, I think he's kind of getting used to it. And once you're used to it, I think it just kind of becomes this thing that's in the back of your head and you don't really think about it too, too much. And I think he's kind of getting to that point. So now we're starting to see the Gabe Villardi that we saw a lot of um, early on in the season as he was – Getting used to his line mates, but now there's a little bit of regularity. Regularity, He seems to feed off Mark Scheifele and Nikolai Ehlers really well. Um, but his, his board plays, I think, what stands out to me the most. He's a, a guy that wins a lot of those battles. And then once that battle's won, and I think against the Montreal Canadiens, the first goal that Winnipeg scores is a result of a puck battle win. And once it's once you're able to pull that puck off the wall, you got Mark Scheifele and Nikolai Ehlers on your line, a lot of good things are going to happen. Mark Scheifele coming up a little bit later on the podcast. Uh, Mitchell Clinton uh, continuing his success on the broadcast Thank at 680 you. CJOB and Power 97. Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you and your family. You as well, good sir. Reminder, Mark Scheifele is on the way here on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Many thanks to Mitchell Clinton, my earlier guest, to go over the special teams issues and, of course, Gabe Velarde. And speaking of Gabe Velarde, Man, what a performance in Los Angeles and his return to California to face his former team, the Los Angeles Kings. Gabe Velarde is our Play of the Week subject. Time after a practice, he's, he's always got the time. He does. And Velarde shoots and scores! Gabriel Velarde on the backhand. He comes home and gives the Jets a two-goal lead. Unbelievable homecoming for Gabe Velarde. All right, the original six uh, visitor stretch continues here at Candle Life Center. Wednesday, the Detroit Red Wings are in town. Andrew Kopp is back here in Winnipeg. And then finally, the last game before the holidays, the Boston Bruins. Those games are never boring. The Bruins are cruising right now. Make sure you get your tickets right now. WinnipegJets.com slash tickets. Detroit Wednesday, Boston Friday. Mark Scheifele is coming up on the podcast after this. Hi, I'm Gabriel Velarde. And this is the Ground Control Podcast. Are you looking for something to do over the holidays? Well, we have an answer for you. Go to winnipegjets.com slash tickets. Everything you need is right there. You can go to the New Year's Eve Eve game. It's a matinee affair against the Minnesota Wild. Or on January 2nd, the first game of 2024, the Tampa Bay Lightning are in town. And I guarantee you right now, those games are never boring. You don't have a bad choice here. It's the Wild on New Year's Eve Eve or the Tampa Bay Lightning on January 2nd. Get tickets to one or both at winnipegjets.com slash tickets. Mark, um, we'll ask you just a couple of questions before we get to the meat of the matter here. Um, just the relief you have felt after your that last contract you signed. I know you're very excited the day of, but how does it feel now that it's so far behind you? 
yeah, it feels like feels like you know forever ago now. Yeah. But uh, it feels good. You know, it's it's it, you know I'm, I'm really happy with my decision. I'm you know it's been it's been a great start to the year. So that's obviously been. Um, you know, that's made it even better, obviously, but it's, you know, it's nice to have it over with, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I kind of have to pinch myself and be like, you know, imagine actually going through it a different way, uh, right now. And I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything for the world. So I'm, I'm really excited and really excited for, you know, the way the team's playing. So, you know, uh, I can't complain. You think about all the mentors you've had over the years, and mentors are so important, especially professional sports. You think about Dale Howard, Chuck, you think about Adam Oates. Yeah, obviously all in very, very different ways. Um, you know, obviously Dale was, was you know a huge part of me at a you know at a younger age mm-hmm. so you know very a lot a lot of things to learn a lot of uh, a lot to pack in into you know you know probably only like realistically two years because I was up up for you know the one year and then that uh, the lockout year uh, I came up after so um, you know a lot of, a lot of packed into a, in a little amount of time and you know I learned so much from Dale um, he was so instrumental in just kind of teaching me to think hot differently about hockey and, you know, just work on my game. And, you know, it was, it was such an amazing time I had in Barry and I'm so thankful for that time that I had with, with that team and, and mm-hmm. especially with Dale and, um, you know, and then obviously, you know, I've been with, been with OC for a long time now, probably, I think it's been like eight years. So, um, and time's flowing on that one. Yeah, I uh, know. And, yeah. and, and, and every, every day there's still more to learn. And that's, that's the one thing I love, I love about him is that he's a guy that continues to watch and he, he's got so many, He's got so much knowledge, and he continues to watch and watch and watch and watch. You know, I, I don't, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't fathom the amount of video that he that he goes over. And um, and you know, every day there's new clips. Every day there's new things to work on. Every day there's every time I talk to him, there's a new a new thought to work on uh, when I'm on the ice. And that's that's what I love about it is because he's you know he's he continues to, to push the envelope. He continues to push the. Um, continues to push me to, to want more and, and to push for more and, and to continue to work on things. And I think that's so, so, uh, um, so crucial in, in, in the game of hockey, cause it's always changing. It's always developing. And, and to have a guy like him on, on my side is, um, you know, is, is amazing. And I'm, I'm lucky to have him and, and excited to continue to learn from him. Fav- well, let's move on to Christmas. It's that time of the year to be thankful. So your favorite Christmas food. <sighs> is this the time of year you would cheat? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like you know, cookies and um, you know everything. I, I love turkey, so I, yeah. I, I gotta go with I gotta go with you know turkey and stuffing and and you know the whole the whole you know turkey dinner. I think um, I'm gonna go with that. Just the tradition. Just of it the everything. tradition of it. I, I I love a good turkey dinner and um, you know eggnog. Actually, eggnog is a good one. I, oh, I love eggnog at Christmas, yeah. and I feel like that's the only time you ever really drink it. So <laughs> I'd go with eggnog. Uh, favorite Christmas movie. It's got to be the Grinch, the the Jim Carrey one. Yeah, uh, my kids just watched that one today. Um, favorite Christmas memory or and or present? Um, I think my favorite Christmas memory, you know, growing up was always, you know, my uh, my best friend Brendan. Um, they lived across the street for you know pretty much our well our entire childhood. He's he was like he, I always say he's been my best friend since I was three days old. Yeah, because um, that's when I came home from the hospital, and and obviously he was there, and we were babies, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, every Christmas Eve, you know, uh, it, it would flip flop. It would go between, you know, them coming to our house or us going to their house. And, um, you know, I think the memories that his mom makes the best like nacho dip ever. Um, so I'd say, I, you know, those, those are always the things that I, uh, I think back on and, and miss. And, you know, when I don't get to go over to the, to the Swarages for, for Christmas Eve, that that's something that I always miss, but that's, those are always the you know, the big, the big memories that I cherish with, you know, with my family and his. Obviously family won't be here this year with you. How much does Oliver help that? A no. lot. <laughs> yeah, Oliver, Oliver, you know, always puts a smile on my face. So, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, he'll, I'm sure he'll have some, some Christmas outfits on, but, uh, you know, he'll just be excited to, to mooch off all of the, try to get some treats from everyone. Is What's the one thing that Oliver brings to you that, you know, a lot of, that a lot of people can't like dogs are such, they're great. They're loyal, but what's the one favorite thing about the, Oliver? provides for you and, and, and vice versa honestly it's every day every day you come home um and you just see his tag wa- or his, <laughs> his tail wagging um I think I think that's the biggest thing you know no matter if it's a good day or a bad day or a good game or a bad game you know you come home and he's wagging his tail and he's he's happy to see you and I think that that always puts a smile on my face um well you know w- when you signed your contract I was excited that you're clearly here for for the, the team and the, the city but one thing I get someone I get to talk Marvel with a lot with um so let's let's go down the list here and this is the real reason why I kind of brought you here uh Loki Loki 2 arguably the best thing Marvel has done since Endgame in your opinion I, I 
I would say so. I think mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think I don't think there's even anything close. I think um, you know with uh, with Kang being more more present and mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of like setting the setting the stage for everything. Um, you know, I I I, I, I I've liked everything they they've had out, but mm-hmm. I think every I think you know me and a lot of people in, are included in that is you know end game happens and it was there's so much hype and there was so much excitement that. You know, you're kind of continuing to search for that. You've you've, you've had a, you've had a taste of that. And now you just want more of that. And um, obviously, they have to they have to continue to to set up, um, you know, what's to come. But Loki two was it was fantastic, and and you know the ending was 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 wild. But I, I'm I'm really excited to see what they you know what they have in store from now from here on out. But you know that that set the stage for. Um, for some pretty incredible things. Do you think Marvel's put themselves in a tough spot after Endgame, everything leading up to it, that is very hard to duplicate, and that's what everybody wants? I, I think so. They did such a good job. Even, the, like, the whole lead-up from, you know, Iron Man 1 mm-hmm. to, to, to Endgame, everything was, 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 was in such a good succession, and you got, you, you know, you got even more excited. And then, you know, you introduced the, Inve- the Avengers, and the first Avengers was amazing. And um, the way that they, you know, you really didn't see Thanos until very very late and you saw him in a few you know end credit scenes and you saw him um kind of very sparingly um you know like when the when the infinity gauntlet comes out yeah. and and you know you really you really only got like a little a little taste of him but you've you know you felt like you knew it was all you everyone kind of knew it was coming but everyone was excited to to see what actually happens and um and I, I think, like, you have to understand, I think from what I, from how I take it is you kind of have to start from ground zero. There's mm-hmm. a whole new, there's a whole new world coming, coming out. And they, they kind of dived into it a little bit in Endgame, you know, with, with going back in time and the multiverse and all that. But then you have to continue to set it up. And I think that's what, you know, me, you know, what everyone I, I assume is, is, is wanting more Endgame when you have to wait. You know, you, you, we've wait, we waited for however many years for Endgame to actually come. Yes. Um, we have to wait, you know, just as long for, for the, next, uh, the next phase to, to really, like, go through what it needs to to, to be set up properly and, and done correctly. Uh, Secret Invasion, uh, one, you know, one criticism was James Rose being a Skrull. What, what was your end thought of that? Yeah, it was. It was a big criticism. I mean, obviously, uh, I, 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 I didn't mind it. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think about it too much. I thought it was kind of like a, you know, kind of a, a cool caveat to, mm-hmm. you know, that that they actually had someone of such stature and, um, and obviously trust in the in the government. That, yeah, you know, he's obviously behind the scenes. I'm curious what happens with, um, with Talos's daughter. Yeah, and how crazy of powers she has now and like I'm, I'm i'm really curious when that actually comes back into into the forefront i'm excited about to see where you know shang chi mm-hmm. comes back like i feel like I, that movie was so fantastic and Shang-Chi. then and then we haven't seen him since yeah. so i'm kind of like like where, where like i i keep on thinking i'm gonna get a get a taste of of you know what's happened so long ago but you know then when you think back you're like okay like you know just just be patient try to be patient uh, the Marvels. So I apologize to anybody that's listening to this or watching this that hasn't seen the Marvels. I, I just went down the rabbit hole last night with Eric Voss on, on uh, so to, to get a feel of what they were trying to do. So you're, you've had some time to digest it and take it in. What is, what is your end thought of the Marvels and what they brought out? You know, I thought it was good. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, a, it wasn't like I came out like real fired up mm-hmm. um, like I do in a lot of the other movies. Um, you know, I just didn't see the you know, the, obviously, you know, with, at the end with, you know, Monica Rambeau going into another dimension um, and then seeing her mom, which isn't her mom, and seeing, like, I think that, that end scene made me more fired up than, yes. than what um, the movie actually did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the movie, it was, you know, it was a shorter one, so I feel like when I go to a Marvel movie, I always, like, kind of, you know, I, I like two and a half hours. I don't mind sitting in the theater I like that investing, long. yeah. I, 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 you know, when I go to a movie, I want to invest in a lot of time. And, um, you know, the, the, the movie itself was just, was just fine to me. I wasn't, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a, a huge fan. But then at the end, it, kinda, it did get me kind of fired up because it, it seems like, you know, obviously now X-Men getting involved into the Marvel Universe is, is pretty exciting. So I think that, that got me more excited about than the actual movie. So the last one for you, do you think that Marvel's in a lot of trouble right now or you still believe in the process of where they're going? 
I'm going to believe in the process. I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan through and through. I'm not just a bandwagoner that, you know, that popped up, uh, you know, a couple You've years ago. You've invested a lot of time. In I, I've invested a lot of time and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to see it through. I think Kevin Feige is, is a genius and I think he's got a, he's got plans for a lot more. And I think he's trusting in the process as well. He's not trying to just throw out movies that are going to, you know, blow everyone's mind every time. He knows that there's got to be a process to it and they got to do it the right way. And I think I, I, I trust in it. Buddy, uh, thank you so much for this. Merry Christmas to you and your family, and uh, best of luck going forward this season. Awesome. Thank you. I'm not going to lie. I could talk with Mark Shifley about Marvel for another hour, but he only had 10 minutes. It was a game day, so many thanks to Mark Shifley. Of course, thank you to Mitchell Clinton for stopping by as well. That'll do it for the 175th edition of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for watching or listening. A special guest next week, Dennis Bayak, former Winnipeg Jets broadcaster, on his last World Junior Tour, as he'll be heading to Sweden for that one. We'll talk to him just before he departs. That'll be on December 26th for that release. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you soon.